I've recently had the chance to experience SeaWorld Orlando's new attraction titled Pipeline the Surf Coaster, and I'm not sure that it's worth the gamble that SeaWorld took. If you didn't already know, what makes this particular coaster model unique is that first, it's a return of the stand-up coaster for its manufacturer, B&M, which hasn't built one since 1999. While an interesting novelty in the 90s, I think that stand-up coasters definitely deserve to go out of style, because they're just not particularly comfortable. What makes the B&M surf coaster different is that the train floor is themed to an actual surfboard, but also uses different restraints to allow riders to feel more exposed and less restricted. While their traditional stand-up coaster trains lock you into place while standing, the surf coaster also distinguishes itself by allowing the harness to bounce up and down depending on which forces are exerted on the train, allowing riders to bounce up and get airtime during certain moments of the ride. I think this was also intended to allow for a more comfortable ride experience so that riders could absorb the forces of the coaster better, but I unfortunately just found myself rising up in the air and slamming down on my crotch throughout the ride, obviously creating a different kind of problem. What also distinguishes the surf coaster is that it uses a launch, which isn't unheard of for a BNM, but is notable in the few instances where their coasters do include one. I believe that the surf coaster was also intended to signal to other parks that they're more willing to produce coasters with launches, especially if the new surf trains were received well by park guests. This is where I'm unsure if this coaster was a good choice for SeaWorld to gamble with, because I have a suspicion that it may not be received well with general park goers. The novelty of standing up with bouncing seats may look like fun, but it's not really different enough from a normal stand-up coaster to really distinguish itself in my eyes. I would say that my perception of this coaster is mixed, because there are definitely things I do like about it that I was afraid SeaWorld wouldn't deliver on. So let's take a closer look at Pipeline and see whether this coaster makes sense as a good investment for the future of SeaWorld. Something that has always allowed SeaWorld and Bush Gardens to stand out to me is their theming and landscaping. While these parks don't have the overt theming of Disney and Universal, they've mostly done a good job of delivering well-themed coaster parks with great animal exhibits, helping to distinguish them from the likes of Six Flags or Cedar Fair. These parks have traditionally been relaxing places to go and grab a few beers and ride some diverse, world-class coasters. However, I've done a video a while ago chronicling the changes in corporate ownership of SeaWorld parks over the last decade, and it has definitely affected them for the worse. One of my largest issues is that the parks are pivoting towards thrilling coasters, but not focusing on the theming that allows them to stand out from their competition. This is notable with their 2022 slate of coasters that they opened across their parks, with almost nothing visually remarkable to tie them into their respective parkscapes. SeaWorld Orlando's Icebreaker is a fun little coaster, but the theming is extremely minimal. Busch Gardens Tampa's Iron Gwazi is fantastic, but it only has a covered queue and station because it's reusing what was already there. I think the most egregious examples are Pantheon of Busch Gardens Williamsburg, with almost no landscaping or theming at all, and somehow, Emperor at SeaWorld San Diego is even worse, existing in a gravel field and not even bothering with a covered station. Now of course, the reason that these coasters had these issues was because the company was reeling financially from the 2020 shutdown, but I was extremely skeptical that SeaWorld would bother doing much better going forward. With this in mind, I'm glad to say that an effort was actually made to theme Pipeline. Uh, sort of. When you're walking to this area, you'll be met with surf rock playing throughout, which is a nice touch. I also like these service doors nearby, which, while simple, are painted to add to the surfing theme. As you move along the pathway that the coaster winds around, the landscaping is rather unremarkable, though the palm trees are a nice tropical touch. However, what surprised me was that the coaster actually has a water feature, which was more than I expected from SeaWorld currently. Coasters that work their kineticism into an area of a park are great in contributing to the atmosphere of, well, that particular area, 
and SeaWorld does this best with Manta, especially with its water feature as the train rolls by. While the area around Pipeline is much less exciting, I do think that its water feature is a nice touch that I really did not expect SeaWorld's current leadership to approve. The Pipeline Station and adjacent gift shop are also themed to reflect the beach as well, which, again, is more than I expected from SeaWorld, even if it is minimal. In conjunction with the surfboard train, I'm happy to see SeaWorld at least kind of making an effort with this, even if it's far less compelling than previous projects in the park. So, now that I've discussed the theming, what is the ride experience actually like? As the train pulls out of the station to a themed spiel, it parks on the launch for a few seconds. Once the launch engages, the train accelerates to 60 miles per hour and moves over a small bunny hop, which provides a bit of airtime. The train then sails through a banked turn and twists through a hill before diving into the water feature and moving through a corkscrew, which is the only inversion. Coming out of this, the train descends through a helix and completes the rest of the course, which is a series of hills and helixes that whip riders around and eject them upwards to evoke the feeling of surfing on waves. It's not a particularly long or intense coaster, but I do enjoy that it attempts to abstractly convey the sensation of surfing. So what are my negatives about the experience? Well first, as I've stated earlier, the airtime ejects you from the seat and you'll often slam down on your crotch. I wouldn't describe it as painful, but it's not particularly pleasant either. Second, I found the experience to be strangely nauseating on all three rides that I got on it. I'm not someone who ever feels nauseous on rides, whether it be the normal culprits like Forbidden Journey, Cosmic Rewind, or Mission Space, but for whatever reason, the sensation of bouncing on this coaster left me feeling mildly nauseous, which is something that's unusual for me. Perhaps it was just how I felt that day, which again is abnormal, but I have a feeling that's going to cultivate a reputation as a nausea-inducing ride among general park goers. My third criticism is that for the novelty of the seats bouncing, I just don't think that the layout is interesting enough for the coaster to stand out. I understand that it's meant to be a more casual experience that plays with the idea of surfing, but I personally prefer every other coaster in the park over this, because they're just all such strong experiences. Overall, it would consider this to be a mid-tier B&M coaster, but with a fun novelty. From there, the question arises though, is the novelty enough to allow this coaster to feel like a worthy addition to SeaWorld? At a time when SeaWorld Orlando is marketing itself as the coaster capital of Orlando, I think it's important that each and every addition really counts. Journey to Atlantis has great theming, Kraken is an aggressive floorless coaster, and Manta is pretty solid for a flying coaster, enhanced by its lip tone music, visual kineticism, and fantastic aquarium that hugs its indoor queue. On the other hand, Mako is easily in the running for best coaster in Orlando, with its impressive layout and how it builds anticipation on the lift hill with its fantastic music tracks. The way it's incorporated into the shark exhibit is a huge plus for it as well. Finally, while Icebreaker is hardly themed and its paint scheme is a bit ugly, its small layout is impressively aggressive and fun to experience. Every coaster at SeaWorld really feels distinct and diverse from one another, so does Pipeline match up to the others? Well, for me personally, not really. The bouncing seats that give you generous airtime is a new novelty for a stand-up coaster, but it's not really all that exciting and is generally kind of uncomfortable. It's an interesting idea in theory, but I just don't think it works very well in practice. Combining an underwhelming novelty with an underwhelming layout just results in the coaster feeling like it, well, exists to fill up space which I don't think is what SeaWorld wants or needs. Visually, the area has a nice bit of kineticism, and it's exciting to see the coaster running from the park entrance, but I don't think that it really built excitement in the same way that the other, more intense coasters around the park do. I'll give SeaWorld credit for trying something new with this coaster, and for putting in more theming than I honestly anticipated that they would, 
but I'm just not sure if this coaster is really anything other than filler. At a time when Universal is building Epic Universe, I think it's critical for SeaWorld to distinguish itself as a desirable destination when it's so close by, and if they're going to commit to coasters, I think that every one of them has to really be a hit. Now of course, this is just my opinion and a matter of personal preference, so perhaps Pipeline will really be successful among general park goers, which I hope it is, especially because I want SeaWorld to improve and try more interesting ideas in the future. I'm incredibly intrigued that the park seems to be constructing what appears to be a family-oriented straddle coaster around the penguin exhibit, which is something that sounds like it will be a lot more unique. So have you ridden Pipeline, and if you have, what was your opinion? If not, is this coaster enough to draw you to SeaWorld if you weren't interested in going otherwise? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. If you want to help this video out, you can do me a favor by simply hitting the like button. As always, if you enjoy videos like this, be sure to hit the subscribe button with bell notification as well, so as to be alerted to new videos as they release.